Okay, welcome to the CZO seminar. Can you hear us, Jill? Put your thumb up if you can hear us. How come we can't hear her? Oh, we've got you muted. You have to put your thumb. I'm not muted, so can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. We can hear you now. Okay, okay so welcome everybody. Oh my gosh, Ken is limping. That's not a good sign. Um, Okay, the seminars are gonna take place here in 117 this semester, except uh, next month. And we don't know where, they're gonna, where it's gonna be next month, but we'll figure that out by next month. Um, the Vado Zone Journal article, contributions for shale hills or garner run coal farm, if you're working on those, um, are due. Uh, Jennifer's doing the whip kind of thing. Uh, the next seminar is about upscaling the CZO models, and anyone can tr contribute to it. So that uh, hopefully we'll have various people, just like this time. Um, we've sent out information that the CZO Savvy Grant, Science Across Virtual Institutes, they are accepting proposals. I think they were looking for people that wanted to go to Europe, right, or summer interns. So hey. So if, uh, if, if there's a graduate, I think it was only for graduate students. It could have been postdocs possibly, but not faculty. If somebody wanted to work in Europe, actually do some re research in Europe, there's uh, a, way, a way that you can write a proposal to do that. Small amounts of money. Um, we're going to invite hydrogeologist Ying Fan to be the all hand speaker. We haven't invited her yet, but we took a vote among um, PIs, and that's what came out as the top vote. And she's at Rutgers, so if she can come, that's what we'll do. All right, so does anybody else have any announcements? How, put your hands up if you're gonna be talking today, if you're part of the shenanigans. So you, you, you Ting, Ben, anybody else? Jill, so that we just have three people talking? Whoa, okay. And what order do we need to go? We're gonna start with Jill? Okay, are you ready to start, Jill? Yeah, I guess so, sure. Okay, so Jill, I did not prepare your CV to give you an incredible introduction. I would like to ask you to introduce yourself um, and tell us which CZO you've worked at and where you are now and everything else and then take it from there, okay? Sure. Um, I won't be able to hear you unless you use this microphone, so. You tell me when to start and I'll start. You can start. Okay, I'm having a hard time hearing you guys on that end, so, you know, um, ping me or something if um, you need to interrupt me. So, <laughs> thanks for having me, whoever's there, all I see is my screen. Um, I'm a new assistant professor at the University of Arkansas in the Department of Geosciences. I did my PhD um, at University of Oregon with Josh Roaring, and then I did a postdoc um, specifically doing cross CZO work at the Boulder Creek CZO with Bob Anderson and all the Suzanne Anderson and all the other people there, and then also at the um, Eel River CCO, so Bill Dietrich, Todd Dawson, and the gang there. And I continue to do research at both of those sites, as well as trying to establish um, some tree-driven research in the wonderful Ozarks. Okay, so what I'm gonna present on today is um, some preliminary work. Uh, some of you have seen me present bits and pieces of this before, but what I wanna do um, is pose this not about the individual CZOs, but more, about, I wanna be a little provocative, um, because since it is a seminar, it's always fun to be a little provocative. And I want to pose some questions that have risen out of 
um, the sensor work that I've been doing at the CCOs. So you can see I've titled this considering the role of, um, I see I can't see the top of it, but I think I have in here hoodwinked by tree throw. So that's going to be a theme that I'm going to talk about. Um, oh, so this is not allowing me to advance. There we go. Um, of course, this involves not just Bill and Todd and Bob, but a lot of collaborators at the um, two CZOs as well as other places. Um, and I'd like to do a caveat that this hoodwinking may not apply to hurricane-dominated regions, or maybe it does. And if there's time, we can talk about that. So. Um, my overarching work has been trying to come up with a, um, a way of coming up with a soil production function in areas where we have tree-driven mechanisms that play a significant role in damaging and turning rock into soil. But as many of you have heard me say before, the problem is it's a big giant black box. We have a lot of conceptual models, but we don't really know what are the mechanisms and we don't know if the mechanisms, frequency, or magnitude varies with species, and with forest structure, and with climate, and with aspect. Um, and then I would like to argue that while my interest is about how trees convert solid rock into soil, trees generate fractures, and fractures big and small matter broadly for a whole suite of below ground critical zone processes. So it's not just about converting rock into soil. And there's a range of hypothesized tree throw mechanisms or tr um, tree converting bedrock, damaging bedrock and converting to soil mechanisms that we can talk about. There's wedging and there's tree throw, our favorite, and there's um, growth pressures. And what I want to say is that wedging and tree throw, those are things we can see. They're above ground. They are charismatic um, mechanisms. But we have all these other potential mechanisms, trees growing in rock and wind-driven tree sway and root swelling due to water uptake. Those are invisible to us. They're below ground. So while not as charismatic, we need to ask, how do they matter relative to things like wedging and tree throw? And so speaking of tree throw, um, it can be rare in many forested settings. I did um, a lot of my PhD work in the Oregon Coast Range. And despite the gigantic Douglas fir there, um, and, the, they, and the way that they shape the topography and the bedrock, not all trees fall down everywhere. But, so on the left, you can see um, a photo of trees inserting their rock into soil and rock below and fluffing it. This is work that Bob Anderson did with one of his students, Benjamin Anderson, to show how trees loft the soil. And then on the right, you can see um, a suite of data from a 2010 paper where on the, it's GPR, ground penetrating radar in the Oregon Coast Range. We did several swaths. This is a representative one. And what you can see are now clear cut, but formerly massive dug fir stems. And below them in that figure A at the top, you can see their role in breaking up the bedrock. This is a place where the soil thickness ranges it's about 0.5 meters, and the rock below is being broken up by these magnificent trees, even though they have not fallen over. So um, I'm not gonna go into detail in how I've been doing this, except to say I'm using a suite of sensors, four sensors that are measuring the forces that trees exert at the bedrock tree interface, um, accelerometers at the base of trees and up the trees to measure tree sway, anemometers, to capture wind, and then of course solar radiation, precipitation, and all the other data that we collect at a critical zone observatory. So this is data from a force sensor at the base of a magnificent 65 meter tall dug fir. To give you a sense of how tall it is, if you follow that yellow dot down, there is a person at the bottom of that tree. This tree, the above ground mass, a, a conservative estimate would be about 27,000 kilograms. So think about how much material is below ground. And what you see on the plot is data from a big wind event on a big storm in the winter in California. The blue is the average wind. The lighter blue is the wind gust. And the green is measuring um, the resistance, which is uh, um, the output value for these force sensors. The sensors here saturate, so I can't give you an actual force, but the timing of the um, changes in forces is accurate. So there's the wind gust. 
And what you can see is that when you get above some number, about six or seven meters per second, this gigantic tree is moving on and off the rock with the frequency of the wind. But the thing is, is that these big wind events don't happen very often. But I can tell you from observation around these magnificent trees that all of them above some certain size have significant fracturing in the surface rock that the tree is embedded in. And so you have to ask questions about how will things like commercial forestry, places like the Oregon Coast Range, where we are now clear cutting trees and growing them to be only 60 or 70 years old, how will things like that and changes in forest for, by climate change minimize this critical zone shaping mechanism when these trees get really big. So this is data from Colorado. This is some ponderosa pines. You can see how different this forest setting is. And the wind here, you get westerlies. They blow from left to right on this figure here. And so on top is the average wind speed and below it is the resistance. And what you can see is that when the wind blows, the tree responds. It responds magnificently. It is recording those gusts. Even the little short gusts are recorded with fidelity by these trees. And then if you come to back to California, this is a tan oak. I don't know how tall it is, but it is taller than that dug for, let's just say 20 meters for scale, but it's a thin little guy. Um, about, I can't see my um, uh, text here, but I think it's about 23 centimeters. It diameter breast height, and you can see the accelerometer at the base of that tree. The sensor saturated with the really big rainstorms that we had in 2016. So all I'm going to show you here is accelerometer data and wind speed data. So the accelerometer data is on the left. It's the X, Y, and Z. And so here you see the tree actually moving, actually swaying at the base. Um, in the X, Y, and Z direction when the wind hits, but the thing is the wind keeps going and the tree stops. And then again, here's a little short um, movement, but in, it's going in the X, Y, and Z. There's the wind. The wind keeps going, but the tree has stopped. And this happens again and again and again on this tree. And the literature supports this, that trees can have self-dampening mechanisms. All the branches serve as individual load cells. So it's a protect protection mechanism for the tree. So you can think about maybe the gusts only matter, the first gusts only matter for trees like that. Now here's a tree that's similar in canopy. It's a, it's a madrone. Um, this is again at the Eel River CZO. And so the canopy is very similar to an oak, but it's much, much stiffer than um, an oak. And there's accelerometer data. Now, in this case, on the bottom plot, I do have force sensor. That's the green. And then, um, again, the same theme with the wind data. The, the light blue is the average wind speed. The dark blue is the gust. So I want you to focus on this part. You can see this tree at the bottom moving in the X, Y, and Z. And you can see how it responds much more like that stiff ponderosa pine in Colorado than it than um, like the tan oak. So perhaps it's really only the stiffness of the tree, the wood properties that matter, not the canopy. But if we want to scale up from these individual measurements, we need to think about this in terms of how do different trees respond to the forces that are exerted on them. And finally, um, this is one of my favorite. This is um, a measurement on a root underneath, uh, it's a five centimeter root underneath a large dug fir. And what you see in blue is shortwave radiation. So at night, of course, no sun. That's the moon that I have at the bottom. That's when that data um, goes flat. And then it peaks during the day when the sun comes out. And you can see that little sun icon pointing to one of the peaks. And the green are forces uh, that that root is exerting on rocks. So when the sun goes away, the trees swell, we know this, they take in water, and the roots swell, and they bang on that rock, and they do it over and over and over again. They do it so many times in the life cycle of a tree that it's enough to impart a stress fatigue to begin to significantly weaken the rock. And then, this is rain events, so when it rains, the roots plump even more. Of course, there's a physiological limit to how much the roots can plump. Um, and so there are times when you have rain events, you can see around 1120 of a rain event, but that root doesn't stay plumped and it doesn't keep plumping 
um, more and more. So the amount of rain and the timing of the rain matters for the work that roots are doing on rock. So um, this is from the rock mechanics side of the world, but we know that wet rock is more susceptible to subcritical cracking. So we have to ask what role does hydraulic redistribution play in settings where you have the um, upper part of the soil and the unsaturated zone of the rock drying out and trees are getting their moisture from much deeper groundwater stores or from fractures, but they are hydraulically redistributing. This is part of the hidden world that we don't know that much about. So we can begin to ask, how does this mechanism that might significantly weaken the rock vary with water availability and species driven differences in seasonality of water uptake? So, these are the preliminary findings, and I've um, posed them you know, as a series of questions we can think about. Wind response may depend on the tree size and age, sip versus bendy, and the forest structure, how the wind moves over that. Barrel fluctuations, general, excuse me, general fluctuations in reports have potential to impart cyclic stress fatigue over the lifetime of a tree that's considerably weakening the unfolding rock. And you can begin to think about how as tree spacing varies, how that might change for converting rock into soil or generating fractures in the um, upper part of the subsurface critical zone. Precipitation generates tree induced forces. I'm not measuring growth forces at all. And um, my hunch is, is that's because the wind is doing the work. The trees are acting as crowbars and are wedging apart cracks. Um, at the, that interface. So you don't need to invoke growth forces for trees to pry rock apart. Um, so I'd like to argue to you that perhaps rock is weakened by multiple mechanisms and only detached by tree sway. And so, you know, we can ask is tree throw actually detaching new rock or only mobilizing already broken rock? And with that, I'll start, stop. Um, I want to thank NSF and more shallow geophysics and trenching and conversations like this. And take any questions. <laughs> Can you hear us clapping? Yeah. <laughs> yeah I have a question. Okay, can I turn? Do you want me to leave the um, this up, or can I turn it off the screen? I can't hear anyone. Uh, uh. Oh. I've just lost any sound. Is it on? Can you hear me now? <laughs> yes, I can. <laughs> You can hear me now? I can absolutely hear you. Hi, Sue. Hey. So um, I just wanted you to talk about um, how deep the roots go for these trees that you're talking about and how deep are your measurements. And then, you know, do you think this wedging thing is happening very deep or just shallow or what? Just give me a depth sort of observation. So that's a great question. Um, and so most of my measurements are pretty shallow. The deepest ones are like the road cut at Boulder Creek where we're able to get to the roots that are half a, me a meter below the tree. That's it. Um, we want to do some excavations and um, I'm commonly Singh and I are planning some projects to do some GPR similar um, to like um, the figure that I showed, excuse me, from Josh's in my paper. Um, so we can at least get a sense of course root extent. We don't know. Um, and I mean, you guys have been doing work on this at Shale Hills. So, you know, it's going to depend on where the mass is distributed and if it's shaped like a cylinder um, below the ground or if it's a, you know, oblong football, if it's a triangle. Uh, and one of the questions that Todd Dawson and I have been playing around a lot about is, is that species dependent or is that controlled by fractures? And do you guys have any thoughts on that? I don't know. 
I mean, we know that tree roots decline exponentially with depth, but the mass of those studies were done in soil. And um, the only studies, the significant studies that I know of excavating, excavating tree roots in rock um, was some work that was done with white pine in some cliffs in Southern Oregon. And they did not find an exponential decline, nor did they find a really significant difference in between the volume, the, I'm trying to remember the variable they used, essentially the, the root length over volume, um, coarse roots and fine roots, there didn't seem to be that an ex extreme of a difference. They couldn't pull it out statistically from their data. Is there any other questions? I mean, we can also ask him more questions later, but. So I think it'd be super if, you know, some of these questions, if we want to be able to model across landscapes and think about how they change over time, to begin to think about um, Toby Muneer at Colorado and Bob and I have also been thinking a lot about the shape of the root mass below the ground. Um, and, and we've just been making pretend models with the LIDAR data on the top, but not knowing what the, they look like underneath. Um, so, you know, some collaborative work across CZOs to be able to get a better handle on that, I think would be helpful for a lot of different people for fungi weathering and everything else. Hi, Jill, this is Jason, can you hear me? Jason can. Yes, hi, Jason. Hi. Um, I had a question about the swelling roots. I mean, roots are generally under under tension, not pressure. And then when they get saturated, they're still going to be near near zero. And I was just wondering how much pressure does it take to uh, to crack a rock? And you know, can a root ever really have that much pressure? So here's what's super cool: they don't need that much pressure. So um, you there's so stress fatigue happens. So the numbers that I'm measuring, like they're like 0.02 kilonewtons, and if you trans, so the surface area of my sensors is really small. It's like the size of a thumbnail, and of course, roots have asperities; they're not necessarily perfectly smooth all the way across the rock. Um, but um, those numbers, I think, if I remember. Let's just say they're low. There's something on the order of 0.02 megapascal if you translate it, or 0.2 megapascal. But that's enough um, because if you tap something over and over and over and over and over again, every single tap um, creates a micro crack. And what happens with stress fatigue is you just have to tap it enough, and generally it's on the order of about 10 to the 3 to 10 to the 4 times for those micro cracks to coalesce. And once they coalesce, then you have a significant decrease in the tensile strength of that material. So I've got an undergrad right now, we're just um, ramping up to do some physical modeling where we're going to be doing taps similar to what I'm measuring for the root forces on rock um, cyclically and see um, how the tensile strength changes. Um, the other thing is, is that rock, <coughs> excuse me, is much weaker when wet. So the the at the crack tip in a rock, the bonds um, there's a replacement that happens with I don't remember which what which part of the water molecule, but there's a replacement that happens that that makes that crack um, bond even weaker. So you know roots basically create a wet environment. So there there's a common there's two things going on. They're doing this chemical um, weakening of the rock. And then it doesn't, it can be a very, very low stress. It just has to happen a lot. Yeah. So that's, I, yeah, I mean, that, it's, that, that's what I, um, and yeah. If, if I gently lean against a rock 300,000 times, I think the rock isn't going to break. You know, it's going gonna, it's gonna to reduce the strength of the rock. Okay. So it's not going to break it, but it's going to reduce the strength that it does break at. So, okay. yeah. All right. You're um, you, you brought up a second question. None of the things on, on your list at the beginning of the talk were chemical. It was all about physical. So what, what role does the chemical breakdown of the rock play in making it susceptible to cracks? You know, I wish I knew. We, I, so when we had tree, um, Sue and Dave hosted a tree workshop back in 2015 um, at Penn State in the room you guys are in, I think. And um, one of the people there uh, 
Help me out, Sue. Susanna. Susanna Barlog, Brunstad Barlog. Thank you. The basic, the basic idea is to think of a crack tip is really a chemical bond. Oh, right? absolutely. But and so oh. basically anything that causes a dissolution process is going to weaken the inside of a crack and make it easier for crack tip propagation. So these roots that are secreting, you know, acids, um, organic acids, organic molecules, can actually weaken that bond and make it easier for a crack tip. And that's what um, subcritical crack growth, that's what they're talking about in stress corrosion correction. Right, well, there's, there's two different things actually. There's the micro cracks and the stress corrosion. Um, but the other side of just a root passively sitting there and exuding um, organic acids, and of course, um, fungi weathering, my understanding of this, and I am a geomorphologist, so, um, but I've talked a lot about this with Susanna, and there, it seems as though there still is super unresolved for rock because what's measured in the field, as usual, is orders of magnitude smaller than what people measure in the lab. And some of it has to do with, in the lab, um, you don't have, you are isolating different microbes, and so you don't have some of the competition that you have in a field setting. So people, you know, whether they, it's just weathering a few microns in or whether it's weathering centimeters in, I've been asking this, and, and I've been asking this question for a while, and um, I, there's people at the Eel River CZO we're trying to work on now. I think you guys are working on it, Sue, aren't you? Working on what? Sorry. So on, on the, the, bio, the geochemical weathering. Um, a little bit. I mean, yeah. Around roots, you mean? You're asking about around yeah, roots. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, so I, for, the, for, the, for simplicity's sake, I ignore it for now, but it's, you know, it, it totally rides along every time you stick a root in rock. Yeah. So um, I think we have three people that are going to talk in this hour and a half period, and the next person is Ben. We should probably segue to him. He's going to talk about tree throw, aren't you? And uh, he's... Jill going to be able to see the slides and everything? Yeah, and so maybe we'll have more questions for you after we listen to Ben. So introduce yourself a little bit. All right, yes, yeah, so my name is Ben Dillner. Um, or, um, and I'm a new master's student um, in Jason Kay's lab. Can you hear me, Jill? I can hear you. I see a slide that says Danny Shapich. Is that correct? Yes. OK. And if not, no big deal. I mean, it is a big deal, but you know, I don't want to hold anything up. Ah, yay. Yeah, so I'm going to be doing, um, carrying out my master's thesis project, um, the Shield Hills catchment. Um, so I'm just going to kind of give a, a brief overview and introduction to my project. Um, we can go back to the first microphone here. Okay. Um, yeah, so my project will be focusing on plant regeneration and resource availability and a tree tip up chrono sequence um, for shale hills. Um, so, as, as everybody knows, um, tree tip ups um, have a pretty significant impact on a forested landscape. Everything from soils, uh, microtopography, um, to the vegetation. Um, and sort of main mechanism um, of their impact um, is they're, they're creating these microsites um, so that the pit and the mound pairs, which we see in many forests, they uh, have fundamentally different char characteristics than the surrounding forest floor. Uh, so there's been a lot of forest ecology research that's focused on sort of the gap dynamics of these tree tip-ups um, and their effect on the ability of canopy trees to um, regenerate. Um, but I, coming through all the research um, that's been done, um, I think that the literature is lacking um, in looking at sort of the, the microsites um, and their evolution in terms of sort of all uh, forest understory plants. 
um, and specifically with a focus on um, plant resource availability and how that uh, changes over time um, as the, the soil is developing on these pits and mounds. Okay, so my, my specific research questions um, are how does the vegetation on the pits and mounds differ um, between that with the undisturbed forest floor? Um, and as we see, um, is, is there a predictable successional pattern of this vegetation on the pits and mounds over time? Um, and are tip-ups uh, facilitating, facilitating regeneration of canopy species um, in these microsites? Um, and then from the soils and plant resource aspect, um, how does the plant resource ability on these microsites differ from the undisturbed forest floor? Um, and how is that resource availability changing over time? Okay, so my, I'll just give a brief, brief outline of my, my project plan. Um, so the first thing I, I'm gonna be doing, I've already started doing that, um, is selecting uh, tree tip-ups from many different age classes. So there was a, a large blowdown event um, in August of last year, uh, which we had a, a meeting right after. And so th those will sort of be the, the first, uh, the earliest class of tree tip-ups, which are the youngest. Um, and then th there's tip-ups that, you know, go back, um, you know, probably over 100 years. And they're going to be creating um, a, a chrono sequence based on the, sort of the different age classes of the tip-ups that, that I can identify within the, the CZO. So probably the oldest ones well, I'll be able to, to see a, a visible pit and mound are maybe 60 to 70 years old. Um, and I'll be basing their age off of uh, the decay class of the, of the trunk, sort of roughly. And then I'll be refining the age um, more, to be more precise um, using dendrochronology techniques. Um, and either coring the, the fallen trunk or coring surrounding trees to look for a sort of a growth release date. Um, and then I'll be doing some 3D imagery of the tip-ups um, by taking a series of pictures all around them and using uh, Roman's magical software to um, create these 3D models, which, which I can use to, um, <clears throat> to measure the the microtopography and the dimensions of these tip-ups. Um, and then I'll be doing vegetation surveys, so on, on the pit and the mound, and then sort of at, at varying distances, doing like belt transects outside the pit and mound pairs. And also be looking at sort of light availability on and soil uh, moisture on the pits and mounds, and also comparing that to the undisturbed forest floor. And uh, I'll be doing a series of, of soil cores so some shallow cores that are just 10 centimeters, um, mostly looking at nitrogen availability, and I'll be doing that several times throughout the growing season, uh, looking at soil moisture, cations, um, it, with, with some of these deeper cores that I'll be doing um, on the pit and mound and also the surrounding area. And looking at um, the rock fragments on these different ages of tip-ups to see uh, if the rock fragments are generally smaller on, on the older tip-ups um, because the, the rock is weathered or really what's going on with that. Um, and, and seeing and trying to see how the soil is developing on these pits and mounds and seeing if there is sort of a predictable successional pattern of plants uh, that we're seeing on these disturbed sites. So it's just a summary of my project plan. So I'll keep you updated. Yeah. <clears throat> Um, yeah, yeah. So far, I've identified um, probably twenty or so tip ups that I'd like to look at. So I'll, I'll still still need to. I'm, I'm going to do about a total of forty um, tip ups, and there's eight different decay classes. So five uh, de decay class. So uh, the different ages of these these tip ups, um, and I'm basing that off of the decay of the, of the trunk that you can see. And I've done some imagery work. So I've taken pictures of about 12 of them so far. 
Um, but mostly I'm just trying to figure out um, my, my strategy for sampling. So, uh, this is a kind of joint money question for Ben and Jill, if Jill can still hear me. Hi, Jill, it's Joan Marie. Um, so, I guess I got really excited about this work, the work that you're doing specifically with the imaging of the rock fragments that come up with these root wads, because I think it's possible that this work will help answer Jill's sort of chicken and egg question of when trees tip over, are they fracturing rocks or are they just able to bring up rock that is already fractured? So um, I guess my sort of open question for Ben and Jill then is like, what sorts of data do we need to collect in tree tip up mounds such as what we're showing here? You know, what kind of data will help us to answer that question? And are there ways that maybe you're thinking of addressing that? And then I was wondering what Jill was also thinking about maybe how she was going about answering that question, I especially using the sort of unprecedented ability to map out the relationship between roots and the solid rock that they bring up um, with, the, with the photogrammetry. Yeah, so I mean, I, I don't think I'm specifically addressing that question with my research, but I, I may be able to draw some conclusions about it, especially because the the imaging software um, is pretty neat that, you know, allows you to like to measure, um, you know, the rock fragment size in, in the, the root ball that comes up. Um, and just from being out in the field, you know, I mean, I see some pretty large rock fragments in these root balls. Um, and and some some of the pits you can tell they're basically right down to bedrock, um, so definitely I think in in a shale system especially um, where you have you know a lot of very actively weathering uh, bedrock that you know the, the roots are, are penetrating into uh, probably Dave could elaborate a lot more about that but um, yeah I mean it's cool to try to quantify that. Yeah. Yeah. So I was saying I think we'd call that an opportunity for collaboration because I don't think Ben will in, in a master's degree also get into analyzing the images for the rock uh, fragments. But those images are here forever. So maybe we can find a way to use them. And that, that really is one of the reasons uh that we're taking all these images is because they think they'll have lots of different uses. So he said 12 trees he's done. Yeah, that, that one's from, uh, oh, uh, Jill, also, do you want to chime in on Joan Marie's question while we make this image larger? Um, sure, uh, quickly. So the good, great question, Joan Marie, and um, I, um, so two different things. Um, one thing that I, um, I don't, I don't think I'm not necessarily saying that trees don't break off rock when they do fall over. But I'm saying that some of it might happen in the ground already from wind-driven events. Um, I've been. If anyone has ideas on this, and Sue, you might have some ideas in terms of. I've been trying. To, so I putting in a proposal right. Putting trying to put together a proposal right now with Tim White and Ashley Deer. We want to go to Puerto Rico for just this reason, for a combination of things, but I'm interested in doing similar to what Ben's doing um, with imaging the tree throw there and looking at the grain size distribution and trying to see if there's any way of um, discerning if um, they have just been freshly broken or were already broken with the weathering front that the tree just brought up. Um, my experience in the coast range digging pits is that in, there were three sets of grain size distributions that you'd find in the soil. You'd either have very, very shallow um, soil, zero to 20 centimeters on top of solid rock, and that appeared to be soil that had just been moved, um, that wasn't actually being produced from right there. Then you ha would have from 20 to about 60 centimeters um, pits that had um, very fragmented rock in them 
And then you had one other set that went down to about a meter, and those would have two different classes of rocks, very angular rocks and very rounded rocks. And I always assumed that that was a successive generation of trees coming in to a pit and um, <clears throat> that there was a previously weathered rock in there. And then there was the newer rock that the trees were able to break as the roots were able to go deeper. So it'll be interesting to see what you come up with. Yeah, okay, yeah. so to, to further explain the, the image uh, that people are wondering about, um, this is basically just a, a, a screenshot um, from uh, that, that Roman Diabasi sent me. Um, and so you, you take between 80 to 100 images. Uh, I was just using a, ba a basic point and shoot camera to walk all the way around this, this tip up and, and shoot at different angles. And then it gets plugged into this, this software, uh, which I forget the name of, but and then you um, you can't really see, but there, there are some little rulers in the image which you can use it use to scale. Um, so th then you can with the program you can analyze um, with, with pretty pretty good resolution the different features that you're seeing. So. Hmm. Oh, the the blue things represent each image that was used. So it yeah. The, the view from like, yeah. 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 That's true. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the, no, the, the, this picture is just, um, just a, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, in, in a static image, it's really not that useful. But if you're in, in the software, you can do the measurements and you can you can spin it all around and look, you know, above, below, all different angles. Hmm. Yeah. Um, so, so the, the, the chrono sequence um, is basically since I mean, I, you know, ideally you you look at tip ups, you know, over say a hundred year time period. But obviously, I only have like a year and a half left, so <laughs> so I have, I have to use you know like um, spatial and a, you know a single single time period or you know snapshot in time and looking at different ages of the, of these tree tip ups and then trying to make draw conclusions about about that um, and thinking of what would have happened historically so there, there's you know that there's always some things you have to consider you know has how much has the site changed over that time and, and you know the species composition um, but there there's you know a lot of things I'm trying to control for like the location of the, of the tip ups that I'm looking at um, and, and trying you know thinking that the, the forest is you know relatively Similar uh, composition of species. Um, yeah, it's and newer to older, mm. it's not like eight cents a tick. Yeah, yeah, basically. Yeah. Oh no, the, the the age of the tip up. So when the age of of um, the death date, basically. Yeah. So, so can I add one more thing if there's time? Yeah. Course. So ben, ben, if you get a chance, um, what would be su I, I think would be super cool. So um, Josh has a data set um, as well as um, Ed Johnson of the University of Calgary, where they basically show that you don't get rock fragments um, coming up with tree tip ups until the tree is above a certain DBH, which correlates with an age. So um, in the coast range, the trees have to be about 70 years or older, I, th I think the, um, I don't remember what the DBH is, but below that they do not find um, rock fragments in, they don't find bedrock in the, um, or weathered rock in the tree roots. So it'll be interesting when you do your work to see if there's any correlation with um, the size of the trees that you are seeing. Because this is something I've wondered about in areas with blowdowns, where you are tipping trees over maybe more frequently. And, and you know where the trees aren't getting as large because they're being tipped over more frequently. 
how much rock do they bring up? And Sue, you have those great photos of the, all the rock that the trees are bringing up. So I believe it's happening and it um, would be a great addition to the data set for this kind of age um, efficiency um, relationship that other people have been exploring. Yeah, I definitely see an issue. I think, and, and another thing from looking at the literature, um, there's not that much work has been done on like a shale site and a lot has been done um, kind of on granite sites or especially in the forest ecology research. So I think, yeah, where, where you have a lot more actual fragments in the, the regolith. Sorry. Um, this is Yu Ting. Uh, I work with Dr. Ken Davis um, from the meteorology department. This is my fifth year PhD. Uh, I work on the the carbon terrestrial carbon cycle in the Shield Hills watershed. And today I'm going to present on behalf of Yu Ning and Ken and myself, and uh, from a perspective of wall and carbon cycle and most of the work are from the uh, from the model work uh, so um, I think not many are modelers here so I'll explain a little what goes into the model what observations goes into the model to uh, you know to reproduce some model results that are trustworthy or uh, reliable. So for the water, water cycle, it is simulated uh, with flux beam and uh, the model is calibrated with soil moisture uh, from cosmos and uh, discharge and latent heat, sensible heat and water table depth uh, near the stream. So those observations goes into the model to constrain the model. And for the carbon cycle, it is simulated with uh, flux beam BGC, and the observations goes into the model from the uh, carbon site are the you know nitrogen deposition rate uh, measured at leading ridge, and the uh, tree biomass from Margos group and uh, above ground MPP, and uh, the ratio, well the ratio of M the MPP over tree biomass we define as uh, mortality or turnover rate. I know that's not what the, uh, ecologists call the mortality, but uh, that's uh, what we use in the model. And so those data goes into the model to constrain the, the carbon cycle part. And for all the calibration process, um, in all cases, but the nitrogen deposition, so we adjust the model, uh, model parameters instead of adjust the variables. And uh, I'll come back to the NEP measurements. That's the flex tower measurements. Uh, I'll come back to this point later because I need to show you some results and then be able to discuss this point. Uh, but uh, we use observed nitrogen deposition to create uh, to the observed Nitrogen deposition helped us to match the model of NEP with the uh, with our observations in summertime. Uh, net ecosystem productivity is um, how much carbon is assimilated into the uh, forest minus uh, how much carbon is lost to uh, respiration, hydrotrophic and autotrophic. Okay, uh, so these are the model results for, uh, from flex PIM. And the trees can definitely modify the water partition. And this is the total precipitation that we observed in Shield Hills. And this is how the uh, water get partitioned into different uh, pools. So you can see the trees transpire a huge fraction of the, uh, the water budget. 
and the other part is the discharge. <laughs> and here's a spatial pattern of the transpiration and you can see uh, the difference between north facing and the south facing uh, transpiration so uh, because the trans Transpiration is driven mostly by soil moisture and radiation. And the south facing side, they have more radiation coming in. So there'll be more transpiration. And also, in the, you can see the stream and a little swell because the soil moisture are uh, higher. So better for the trees to transpire. Just to be Yes, this model has a, yeah, this model um, has a, can represent the topography and also has the radiation simulated according to the topography. So it can reflect the, the radiation difference caused by topography. And uh, here's a spatial pattern of carbon fluxes. Uh, GPP is gross primary productivity. That's how much carbon goes into the forest. Uh, and uh, you can see the stream, valley floor and the swales have higher uh, productivity. And uh, NPP is GPP minus autotrophic respiration. And ha they have very similar patterns. And NEP, for the model, uh, the model runs into equilibrium. <laughs> and that's another term that I need to explain. Um, so that's the input of the carbon is about the same with the output of the carbon. So NEP is theoretically should be zero when it reaches equilibrium state. So the carbon goes into ecosystem, the photosynthesis should be equal to the respiration. So it's a very small, yes. It's not true for the, for Shield Hills, but every ecosystem model does that kind of work. Uh, so it's very, uh, it's a very small number here. And then heterotrophic respiration, that's a decomposition part. You can see uh, higher, you can also see the spatial pattern of the, you know, the topography valley floor as well have higher uh, decomposition rate because of the moisture condition uh, favors the decomposition. And all this, uh, oh, sorry. <laughs> and in, uh, this uh, is simulated by flux beam BGC and assume uh, every tree here is a deciduous tree. We ignore the evergreens in the you know, in the stream and uh, some on the ridge top. And this is a spatial pattern of carbon and nitrogen pools. Uh, it's, this pattern is, uh, is driven by soil mineral nitrogen pool, the distribution of uh, soil mineral nitrogen. But we don't have, uh, we haven't compared with the um, observations of nitrogen or yeah, so we're not very certain. <laughs> yes, this is all modeled. Yeah. Yeah, it's homogeneous. Every grade, every grade receives the same nitrogen. But uh, yes, the is the nitrogen reaching through the water. The water transport the nitrogen from the ridge to the valley, so they have higher nitrogen. Yeah. Yes. So Jason mentioned 
uh, they measured higher soil mineral nitrogen on the ridge is probably because the trees are not taking as much as uh, nitrogen because they're limited by water. Yes. Earlier on the slide, could you um, feed into the model, observe the LAI, and if there's spatial differences in the amount of carbon distributed around the wall? Okay. All right. Good question. Uh, so the question is, do we feed the model with observed LAI? So for this, we for FlexPin BGC, we didn't use the MODIS LAI to drive the model. But for, for flux PIM, the for the water cycle, it has the, it's it's driven by the uh, observed MODIS LAI. But for uh, flux BGC, we fully coupled flux PIM and BAM BGC, so it's the LAI is modeled. And um, this slide shows you what controls the spatial pattern of carbon, above ground carbon. And you can see it's almost uh, linearly driven by soil mineral nitrogen. <laughs> so yeah, it's very important. Uh, yeah, point we need more, like the nature observation will help us. Yes? Yes, can can just point it out that even if we use more uh, observed LAI, it won't uh, it won't help us with the spatial pattern because the resolution of the remote sensing data. So why did you say end observation Oh, I'm just pointing out since soil mineral nitrogen is so important to the above, above ground carbon pool, we like you know we want to know about nitrogen pools and uh, you know, transport, can we measure those? Yeah, I don't know if we have enough. I don't know if we have enough. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's kind of what I'm getting to. Like, is there, are you going to incorporate soil -like mineral nitrogen observations? Yeah. <laughs> we want that. If you have time, is that kind of what you're saying? Or if the data, like. If the data are suitable. Yeah. Is that conversation happening? Yeah, I think that. We have some snapshots in time that are across space, and they show that pattern that I described with high nitrogen availability on the ridge, but nitrogen changes so much through time that those snapshots from, from a couple days in a couple of years, I think could just lead them astray. I almost trust the model more, I hate to say that, but, uh, but you know, I mean, if I, only have, if, I, if I only have two data points, then yeah. Um, so that's, that's where we stand on that one. But we can talk about it one more time to make sure. I think model is valuable, and observation is absolutely valuable uh, to help maybe consider just part of the time, the part of the season, you know, yeah. when the model can match uh, certain period of time with the observation, and let the model predict the other time. And can you turn it around? Can you tell Jason whether it would be most valuable for him to make his measurements or where? That would be fun. Yeah. <laughs> No, but it might motivate, right. right, it could motivate some sampling because otherwise if it's totally wide open for us, then it's, daunt, yeah. it's daunting to, yeah. to measure nitrogen all the time everywhere. So if you could take us from everything everywhere to exactly what we need, that would be pretty awesome.
All right. And also, what happened to water? In your paper, water mattered too, but you're showing nitrogen mattering a lot. Theta is water, but yeah, but she just said nitrogen drives it. Uh, yeah. Can you tell us about theta? Um, how do I explain this? Yes, uh, I would say nitrogen is the the very direct indicator for the above ground carbon because you know the model says fixed CN ratio for above for all the carbon pools. So I guess nitrogen is a direct indicator. So even though there's a suite of things determining the nitrogen, right? It's the nitrogen that finally arises from this yeah. suite of mechanisms that controls productivity or growth. Or Above yes. Okay. Yeah. But without getting the uh, hydrological part right, it's impossible to get a, you know, because nitrogen involves yeah. in the part in the hydrological cycle. John asked about the spatial pattern for carbon pool. And I was going to point out that butane has done a comparison with their spatial pattern. Jill, can you hear me? Some comparison to the above ground carbon pool as well. Carbon pool that looks qualitatively right for above ground carbon, but the amplitude is too small. And the soil carbon pool doesn't do too well in terms of getting qualitative results. So, yeah. like, uh, what's the empirical basis for the above ground carbon estimate? No, 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 the measurements. The above ground carbon measurements. It's a DBH. Yeah. Yeah. And those are spread across whatever gradient of the moderate and that Yeah. Minus the constant. You didn't use the Yes. Yes, and the root carbon, leader carbon. Yeah, tree roots. We have that in model, and I will show you later because there's a diagram about the carbon budget. And let's move on from spatial, spatial pattern to seasonality. And this is the water part, transpiration. You can see more transpiration than summer. And then this is uh, water balance. The oh, sorry. Wrong oh. <laughs> direction. Yeah. So this is the green bars transpiration. Similar, same with this information, but it has you can see the discharge change over the season. Uh, yeah. Mm. Yeah. And now we come to the seasonality of the carbon. Um, the total, if you add them together, it's the GPP. And then divided to the maintenance, resp oh, sorry, maintenance respiration, growth respiration, and then net ecosystem productivity and uh, 
hypertrophic respiration, that's decomposition. And that's how they spread out throughout the year, uh, throughout the season. <laughs> yeah, the model treat um, maintenance respiration. Maintenance respiration is a function of temperature, Q10 relationship, and growth respiration is just uh, I believe it's either ten percent or thirty percent of the new growth. Uh, okay. I want to spend more time in these two slides. It's the carbon budget for shale hills. I think this uh, can be our discussion to put into the paper. And uh, these slices are all from the observations. And the next slice, oh, sorry, I should, this is, should be observation. And uh, this is from Fluxpin BGC. And that will show some comparisons between the observations and the models. And first, point out to the, you know, our observation, observed above ground NPP, below ground NPP, and estimated by Lauren Smith and uh, Alexi Orr. And then above ground carbon pool, below ground carbon pool, liter fall flux. We don't know how much the root turnover is. And uh, have the soil organic carbon pool from uh, Daniela, Daniela Andrew, Andrews, and uh, microbial biomass estimation, and uh, DOC also from Daniela Andrews, and Hugin estimated the DIC. Uh, this part we don't know. We don't have a measurement. We have the measurement of soil, soil respiration, but soil respiration is the heterotrophic respiration plus the root respiration. So it's hard to partition uh, how much is from the root re respiration, how much is from the decomposition on our measurements. And the tower, uh, so NEP is, should be NPP minus the hydrotrophic respiration, but we don't have a number for this. But NEP theoretically could get from the tower, flux tower, but because the tower is on the ridge top, uh, the data is not, is not good for, for annual summer, summer, uh, summarize. It's hard to you, you don't want to use the data points to add together and get a value for annual, for annual sum. So you end up. So there's point measurements that you can use. Yeah. So I jump here because this is our point. Um, the black points are the observed observed um, NEP from the flex tower. And the uh, gray, gray points are from the model. So we can use um, the data points that are trustworthy to compare the model. But in, during the winter time, the observations are not really trustworthy. We tend to um, underestimate the respiration. Good. So this is summer, like, winter. What can I believe and what can I not believe in that data? So during the daytime summer, when there's a, when, when the atmospheric condition is more turbulent, you can trust the data. So and are the data points, okay. This is good and bad data. Mm. Yeah. Sorry. I yeah. guess I, last time you showed this, I, I was impressed that the summer data looks good. But like isn't the data from September to April bad? Could the other stuff kind of do well? I think you're right. 
was the yeah from October to basically the uh, dormant season. I I did. <laughs> <laughs> I did uh, filter the data I used. Uh, all right. And uh, I filled the gap with other. I know this. All right. So from if we just, you know, stubborn and we, we try to add them together and we get a number of, no. 980 and uh, the model says because it's equilibrium the model drives to the equilibrium so NP should be close to zero there's a huge difference between you know merriment and model and we don't trust any of like neither of them right We don't trust the merriment because you know the atmospheric condition stable. When stable, the uh, merriments are not trustworthy. We don't trust the model because the model force was forced to run into equilibrium. But the, in our forest, it might not be really in the equilibrium. So yeah, somewhere in between. <laughs> Before the before the forest reaches the uh, before they become mature, um, there's generally more uh, carbon going into the forest you know, for growth than the respiration. Yes. So uh, this forest might never really get to zero, especially with tree throw, right? So tree throw, tree throw can delay the time that a forest gets to a steady state, right? Because you get you get canopy complexity and you get respiration losses that eventually become balanced by higher productivity because the higher light lower in the canopy. So it can delay it in a, longer than a hundred years. Makes a lot of sense. And then if you have a hurricane it can set things up. So there's spatial patterns within the forest that might mean that at the watershed scale, NEP is never really zero. Does that make sense? Yeah, I mean, that makes sense. And in fact, even in flat locations, at covariance almost never measures zero. It's always it's always forests are always sinks, maybe because of what we're talking about, or maybe because eddy covariance doesn't work. No. I think empirical data is showing more and more that the trees keep on, that productivity keeps on going. Um, and I think the original model was that people tapered off and respiration happens faster. I think more data is out there that shows it. Well, um, uh, the measurements of the soil respiration tend to show you know, higher respiration than what the tower measures. Right? Yeah, that's very interesting. <laughs> yeah, we can. Yeah, I mean, is there is there something you can check? Can put all the numbers in all the boxes. Mm. Do we have any comments about anything? I thought the model simulated soil respiration. Yes. 
So can't we check that? Um, we can check the model versus observe, observes uh, soil respiration. And that's what I'm interested in doing next. Yeah. So we have those data. Yeah. And there's the right spatial and temporal resolution. So let's try that. Yeah. Oh, wait, we have respiration error modeled as almost a thousand. And we have measured NPC of, what's our measured NPC? 650. Yeah. So then we're going to have, I mean, just putting those two numbers together. Uh, Next. Yeah. The carbon. Like, right. But, uh, but the, uh, the model NPP is also higher. higher. Yeah. So if we force the model of NPP to go up to match our observations, this will also go up because the model wants the NEP to be close to zero. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, this agreement in NEP is interesting and maybe more significant to worry about. But if the model's being forced, Equilibrium. Yeah, we Something's can. Something's happening with the model. But it's not being forced to have that MPP. <laughs> so it manipulates, it manipulates the respiration to force the header to, to force the NEP to zero? Well, it's coming to equilibrium with the environment and the nitrogen deposition. So, so that suggests the system would hasn't. I mean, it, it turns out. Oh, look at this. We're talking about here. And the carbon pools are inconsistent with the observed NPP and carbon pools. So I was assuming it started saying. state were about it having greater NPP, where in fact the model suggests that your measurements of NPP are too low. So it's an interesting puzzle. Something's not right. What's wrong, I'm not sure, but that's a good question. Can you plug it into like a positive NEP? Are you going to upset? <laughs> <laughs> like if you just say like, all right, it's not zero, but it's positive because it's growing. Is that a bad thing? Not quite yet. But there are some terms that we can model, but we cannot measure. <laughs> <laughs> you should stick to those. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, and this is our discussion about NEP. Uh, we already did that. And uh, here are some measurements that we could measure to constrain the model. And I did a sensitivity analysis. And with all those parameters in the model and some model output that we're interested in, uh, you know, the red, you know, goes up when the number goes up means those, those parameters become more important to this kind of uh, model output. For example, mortality is important to, you know, root carbon, vegetation carbon pools. And uh, so I selected a few parameters from the study say can we you know measure those and constrain the model and this is if we care for the you know carbon pools and fluxes in the valley floor oh I'll, I'll go back to this but um, if we care for the differences between the valley floor and the ridge top so we want the spatial structure to be correct and, and they're they're similar it just um, those vanguard, if you um, look to the, you know, the switch between the color. What's, what's the lens? Huh? The and lens. It's yeah. the 
Langen Newton parameter. Oh, yeah. So that's the Langen Newton for alpha. Uh, we need to call this beta, alpha beta. And yeah. uh, that's. Yeah, you can measure some of those data to constrain those parameters. Um, possible next work. We don't have to discuss this. <laughs> but yeah, I'm interested in the soil respiration data to compare observation model and potentially to tune some of the so you know, hydrotrophic respiration or plus root respiration maybe can help us, oh no, not this one. I know you can help us with some parameters. And uh, this is from sensitivity study to find out some measurements to that are important that we can go and measure, we should go and measure. Uh, Uh, it's 10 hours, the meal of carbon. Yeah. You yeah. have to be so thank you in your class. All right. <laughs> you seem to be cheering up. <laughs> is, is Jill still on there? She is still there. Okay. So we're, we're getting towards five o'clock, Jill. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. You know, just in the last five minutes, this is one of the areas where we've got a lot of work at these different scales and we haven't been able to really bring things together. One person that couldn't be here apparently is Lee Lee, and I know she got some money from the Department of Energy to start to try to make a model of a root tip, and I think you're working on this with her, right, Jason? Um, weathering around the root tip and that sort of thing. So it's almost like we have the different pieces of the puzzle at these different scales, but we, boy, we still have a lot of trouble talking across this whole thing and being able to pull it together. But I, I actually thought this was, I mean, this was good, you know, pulling, pulling some strands of it together. Does anybody have any comments about that or where they want to go with it or anything? It's kind of long, hour and a half slots and we just petered out of energy. Does anybody have a comment? Jill, do you have a comment? Of course I do. <laughs> so uh, I wanted to thank you for um, letting me join in. And um, I do think um, I'd like to stay informed with what you guys are doing, um, especially there's two modeling efforts that I'm involved in, one with uh, Greg, well, three, I guess, one with Greg and Greg um, Tucker and Bob Anderson to look at um, tree life cycle on how the how that controls this conversion of rock to soil. The other one is with Toby Manier and Bob Anderson. We're looking at um, th this question of what is the root extent and the shape below ground and doing some above ground um, wind modeling and basically just looking at um, force dynamics below the ground. And that those are both going to be coupled with some work that I'm planning to do Scott McCoy at University of Nevada where we want to do some um, rock mechanics modeling um, and look at the propagation of cracks and I can, I can see places in there where we could add in things wow. like the biogeochemical weathering on top of that. So I think there's opportunity to try and cross some of these scales um, as we move forward. Yeah, you and I also talked about whether you wanted to come out here and put in some of your fancy sensors in our in our rocks and trees. So you're still welcome to do that. You're, you have an invitation. Okay, yeah, thank you. You always like visiting Shell Hills. Yeah, you'd be more than welcome. Any other final comments or questions or anything? Shall we give ourselves a round of applause? Thank you, everybody. <laughs> so our next one is about um, upscaling. So it'll be similar to this one, multiple people talking. Thanks a lot, everybody. Thank you, Jill. Thank you. Bye, all. Bye-bye.